And well, perhaps to um, kick it off, uh, you know, could I um, perhaps ask the, the three um, panelists uh, to, if you'd like to make any comment. Um, so uh, Sheridan, you, you've just mentioned these future directions relative to the key documents that you've just shown us. But I'm just wondering how, you know, with the kind of perspective of your careers, what you see as some of these immediate um, directions in the heritage field uh, in the years coming forward, uh, noting in particular this idea of a field that's shifting with the community at its core and that and communities becoming uh, perhaps more and more prominent, prominent in discussions and driving uh, heritage at the moment. Yeah, well, I suppose two things from my perspective, and, and mine is a, a New South Wales perspective. Uh, I see the state government here being less and less involved with the statutory process that has supported heritage. Uh, I think that that's really changing. Perhaps it's come the full circle. There's less engagement in statutory process and more in supporting owners and community through information and guidance and so forth to look after places. Um, for my international work, the, the change, the major change that I see is, is definitely an increasing understanding that the sustainability of development and the role of heritage within sustainability is the most crucial issue for the future. So as Peter said, whilst we started with architectural heritage and we moved into a contemplation of social heritage and other values, archaeological values, etc., of heritage, I think now we're starting and, and will continue to see it as being part of how society can continue in the face of massive climate change and social change that goes along with that. I, I, I think for me it's the challenge I see is exactly what Sheridan said in terms of what's in the future, but I think also the challenge is, and coming right back to the beginning to build heritage, is the fundamental challenge of conserving fabric. And I think one of the things that's been um, a, a loss in a way is that we actually are losing our skills and knowledge in practice of simply applied conservation. And I think, Sheridan, I suspect New South Wales is the same as Victoria, not only in professional skills, trade skills, but there's this still in the background, this fundamental question, you have cathedrals, you have churches, you have government houses that have physical conservation needs that don't go away. And so I think there's an appetite for the future, the environment, energy, all of those issues, but there's still a requirement to conserve. And I, I think at the moment, there's a bit of a gap forming and, and it comes to professionals and, and where people go in your individual careers. Um, but that concerns me and I think it concerns others that would actually de-skilling almost in one area uh, of, of practice that is worrying for me. Um, Can I say another thing I think that is a, certainly a tension in, um, at present and for the future is just the um, intense of the growth of our cities and, and of our regional centres as well and the pressures that that places on heritage. And, and, and on the one hand, uh, we have a society who, uh, which is an, an urban, largely urban society, uh, and where there's a necessity for, uh, you know, to be a bit smarter about the way that we use land and the way that we um, uh, house people and, and, and house working environments and all of that sort of thing. Uh, but on the other hand, um, those areas which are the most strategic for um, intensification of that kind of, of use are also often the areas that have the uh, most heritage. And an obvious example of that is in our uh, kind of shopping strips in, in the inner metropolitan area in Melbourne. And I'm not sure, Sheridan, whether it's the same in Sydney, but yeah. there's a kind of broad uh, uh, overarching uh, uh, state and local government uh, view that we have to have much denser development in our uh, commercial retail centres and that's very reasonable 
in all sorts of ways, but it certainly leads to a real tension in relation to heritage issues. And as and Peter alluded earlier to the question of you know, retaining facades and, and allowing development behind, um, there's just an ongoing uh, dialogue about uh, the legitimacy of that sort of practice uh, in, in general and also in terms of individual instances. The other thing that's happening is um, there's also within the community, one of the changes within the community is an ever increasing appetite for heritage controls. And so that then leads to uh, the potential for sort of locking away large areas that otherwise, you know, 10 years ago would have been thought uh, prime uh, opportunities for redevelopment. So those tensions, I think, are only going to intensify in, in the future. I had a question, if I could. Um, just a general question I was curious about. Um, thank you for the talk. It was really interesting to hear about all your careers. You know, you could do so much with um, heritage. Anyway, um, so the theme that of community that I found came up. Um, obviously, these last few years have come with a lot of social change. And in a contemporary society, I was wondering, as we get more multicultural, is there a difficulty reconciling with what heritage voices come through louder as we plan our cities and as we look at what heritage we sort of deal with these days? Um, yeah, what are the prominent voices, I guess, um, and what are your sort of perspectives in choosing, I guess, what is more important to you? It's, uh, <laughs> Sandra, a really interesting question. I remember at one phase in the 80s, there's a practitioner in Melbourne, um, who I'll name, Alan Willingham, who had a great interest and probably still does in the Mediterraneanizing of traditional 19th century Melbourne. And when uh, people went along, pulled off the veranda, put on a concrete veranda and put down uh, terrazzo tiles or floors and transformed much of inner Melbourne. And that was a proposition, a direct product of migration, of a new culture coming into Melbourne. And where do you place that in a heritage sense? And uh, gentrification of inner Melbourne happened. All those houses lost their Mediterranean look and, and became beautifully restored Victorian houses again. And it's a really interesting question. What is the value of a migrant, a multicultural community? What value do you place on Victoria Street in, in uh, Abbotsford in terms of the Vietnam, Vietnamese community? Um, Footscray, um, and we've always been selective. We've tended to prioritise one over another um, because it tends to be physically driven. And uh, I think it, it is something that we all, it's part of contemporary heritage is really grappling with those issues. Is that physical response the right response anymore? Is the response one that is far more encompassing in embracing of a, an evolving, a dynamic proposition not just to focus on a beautiful looking building. Um, and uh, I don't have an answer for you, but I do think everyone is thinking about it. And, and it is part of this dynamic for me, this changing what emphasis is placed on what aspect of value and, and whose value and whose significance. Um, and uh, yeah. Sandra, I think one of the things that really characterizes Australian conservation practice and it's because we've all worked to evolve and create the borough charter um, which many other countries ha don't have a similar kind of a document um, but the borough charter you know talks to us about looking at layers and understanding layers of significance if we have the eyes to see them uh, and, and I've been involved in a really interesting exercise over the last few years which was writing a a cultural history of the suburb of Paddington, which is an old Victorian suburb here in Sydney. And it too has ha had that migrant wave, came through in the immediate post-war era and was really strong. You know, you, you went to Paddington if you wanted to go out by Portuguese tarts or you wanted to get Greek groceries, that's where you went because that's where those people were living. And by and large, that, that the, the presence of those people is now completely obliterated from the suburb. That, that sort of 20 years of occupation has gone. And as Peter says that the focus on 
physical conservation took over. But there's also been an interesting sort of post, I suppose post uh, turn of the century, where there's been a strong um, engagement with the LGBTQI community um, in that area as well, and their place, and how is that told in the physical and the community story is another layer. So Greg Young, who was the original historian in the, in the uh, heritage, for the Heritage Council in New South Wales, he recently edited a book called Paddington, I think it's called A Cultural History, the title's a bit like that. Um, and I looked at the history of planning, but many other authors looked at the histories of the migrant layer, the gay layer, the, the way it is at the present time. So have a look at that as an example of multi community layers expressing how they feel about a place and, and how it could be conserved, how its stories can be told. Oh, thank you. I don't know whether I should add something to that. I think all of that is terrific, but I, I would say that uh, it does raise the question, as you were saying, Sheridan, about layers and so forth. And, um, you know, we started off value with in heritage in Australia, you know, value, valuing our 19th century fabric primarily and having a view that it, the best outcome is if, if it's conserved or restored uh, toward its original appearance, its original character and so forth. And, and it may well be that as part of this kind of changing attitude that that becomes less and less relevant and, and we have just a more inclusive notion about um, how heritage buildings might be treated or even uh, whether they're just conserved in an altered state or whether they're just allowed to be further altered. And we had a really interesting conversation with our clients in Kuwait when we were talking about the water towers and preparing a conservation plan for it, because during the war it had been used for target practice. So there was, you know, significant elements uh, that we, you know where you could see bullet holes and mortar holes and so forth. And we put to them that this was part of the story of the place, and that this what these elements could be left and conserved. They weren't structurally creating any problem and they would assist in telling the story, which was one really about national identity of this place. And that was a very difficult thing for people to come to terms with. So I think it's a question of what are people ready to hear and, and what level of, of um, appreciation and preparedness to see these layers and the values that the layers have that it's different in different cultures at different points in time. And it's interesting that, that no one today, other than in our introduction, have we recognised the Indigenous values of every single property and place that we've ever dealt with in our profession. They've all got an Indigenous value. And one of the things that I was um, working very hard on in the Heritage Council was when we do list things to always identify what country they're on to always have the, the recognition that they are on Indigenous land. And having that recognition broadly across Australia would be a very good thing too. I think um, what's been really, sorry, am I echoing? Um, is that better? Yeah, it's all What's been really interesting in this session and the one um, previously hearing from people about their careers in heritage is that it's a, it's a set of professions that's evolved very rapidly in a way and the, the policies, the training, the professionalisation, you've all seen that evolve from something very informal to something that is now much more formalised but there's, I think it's still undergoing a lot of development and that so that's a really interesting sort of I think set of professions to be involved in because it's still rapidly evolving um, but I don't know if you think anything's been lost it seemed much more organic in its formation and now it's much more formally trained you know you get trained in a um, there's there's formal policy you know maybe maybe it's becoming too formalized no no I think, uh, Hannah, in terms of um, 
the idea of, of layers and so forth that we're just talking about and, and the evolution of ideas about what to do with heritage buildings. Yes, it is, it is entirely possible that um, uh, heritage policy, for example, at a local government level might, might need to be adjusted or broadened to accommodate it. Um, can I ask Peter a question? Um, Peter, you've raised the issue of, you know, the, the physical conversation and repair of fabric as being a sort of skill set which the heritage profession may be in danger of losing. Um, do you think that the heritage profession, in its broadest sense, have a, has enough capacity that you might find that there are, if you like, physical fabric specialists? Or do you think every heritage practice should have those skills? Or is it something actually that the architecture profession should actually be better versed in, is how to actually conserve fabric, or at least understand its technology, you know, in able to sustainably keep more stuff? Philip, I, I, I think that, I think it is, for me, physical conservation logically rests in architecture and architectural training and as, as a place to, for it to exist. I don't think Australia has ever been able to demonstrate it can sustain courses and propositions that are just focused on physical conservation. It is, we're not big enough, we don't sort of do enough of it. So to me, that is, does belong in architecture. And I think, but I think it belongs in architecture as a generalist proposition that every architect coming through, everyone coming through architecture should be exposed to it. I think still, though, it is then a specialist area. And I think that it is an area much as, again, the universities have looked at as a, as a postgraduate proposition of studying it and doing it. I think, um, so I think that we are still lacking and, and increasingly, I would suggest, uh, professionals who really do focus on it and pro professionally practice in the area of physical conservation, that it's become a rather generalist sort of proposition that everyone can have a go at lime mortar or everyone can have a go at telling you what to do with decaying stone. And that just isn't the case. The reality is that it is still a very specific uh, um, professional area and um, I think we do need to regroup and revisit and relook at how we do that and how we address it, because it is, as I've said, I think, declining. And I, th I think that's evident everywhere. Um, I think it's also to make the building industry recognise that it is serious. I think what's happened is there is a view that you can reproduce anything. You can make a fake of everything. You can reproduce joinery and plaster and stone. And there is a diminishing interest in the original. There, there is actually, interestingly, now a decline in people saying, that is a beautiful bit of 1920s plaster work. They look at it and say, well, I can copy that and make a new one and it looks exactly like that. Why do I value what is authentic, what is original? And that also is challenging. I think that this whole, what might be seen as the antiquarian interest in a real object versus a facsimile is, is actually changing. Um, so that I, I think we need to somehow, in amongst all of this as an aspect of it, say, no, there is value in what is original. There is value in original fabric and there is skill in conserving it. And so I probably haven't answered you quite. I've just gone on about that issue, but I, I think it is an area that we've lost a bit of why we value heritage fabric, what it is that makes that original bit of sculpture really, really important, uh, like an artwork almost. And um, so, um, yeah, it, it remains, a, look, it's a long challenge. You and I and others have all talked about how to get that aspect of heritage moving forwards again. And uh, yeah, trying to develop it. 